Hi, in this video, we're looking at single replacement reactions. First, what is a single replacement reaction? Well, there's kind of two different types. One is if you have a metal, and by the way, this is the more common way. If you have a metal that's just a lone element all on its own, and then you have an ionic compound. Now, just uh, remember, an ionic compound is where you have a metal with a nonmetal. Um, occasionally, this isn't a metal. Occasionally, it's hydrogen. Uh, in which case that would act as a cation, but would be a nonmetal. Um, not that big of a deal though. Here's what happens in a single replacement reaction. This lone element here, if it's a metal, would replace the metal that's in the compound already, like this. Uh, when that happens, you have the metal that was in the compound as a reactant off on its own as a product. And then the more reactive metal is going to be in the compound with the nonmetal. Now, how do you know if something's more reactive than something else? Well, that's where the activity series is going to come in. And I'll show you what that looks like in just a second. There is one more variation of this, and that's if the lone element is a nonmetal. If the lone element is a nonmetal, then it would replace potentially the nonmetal in that ionic compound. And so you have to compare the two nonmetals in this situation. If nonmetal X is higher up on the activity series than nonmetal Y, again, we're going to get a single replacement reaction. Uh, and this time, nonmetal Y would be off on its own as a product. Now, let's take a look at that activity series. And it's probably best to kind of digest this with a few example problems. So this is the activity series here. I'll just kind of tell you how this is read. Cations, which are almost exclusively metals, the only exception, of course, being hydrogen here. Um, are listed on the left side, and this left side is meant to be read completely independently of the right side, which just lists anions. And if you'll notice, there's just the halogens here, F, C, L, B, R, and I. Now, the higher up on this list you are, the more reactive you are. So that's what this most means. The lower down on the list, the least reactive you are. The top, you'll see the lithium is the most reactive uh, metal. The bottom, look at that. Doesn't that make sense? Gold is the least reactive metal. So let's do this example problem. We've got aluminum potentially reacting with NaCl. Now, the first question you have to ask yourself is, is this a metal or a nonmetal? Because you want to compare it against the element in this compound that it would replace if it was to replace the element. Uh, aluminum is a metal. Uh, metals are positive ions when they form ions. Um, so I want to compare it against the metal, in this case, sodium and sodium chloride, because both of these are positive. So I go to table 10. I look on the cations list because cations are positive. And I'm looking for aluminum. There's aluminum. And here's sodium. Now look, aluminum is lower. It's less reactive than sodium. And so for this combination of uh, substances, we're actually not going to get any type of reaction. Um, sodium is the more reactive uh, element compared to aluminum, and so therefore uh, this won't, you can mix these together in a beaker. In fact, you can probably do this at home. Grab some salt water and some aluminum foil and just sit it in there. Now, over enough time, eventually the aluminum starts to oxidize, but that's because of a completely separate reaction with the water. Uh, but aluminum and NaCl, we just simply on the other side would write no reaction or no RxN is short for reaction. Uh, sometimes you can just write NR too. Let's look at a different example. How about aluminum with copper two chloride? Well, again, I know that aluminum is positive, so I'm looking at the cation side of this, uh, but this time I'm comparing it against copper. Copper is also positive uh, when it's an ion. So here's aluminum, like from the last problem, but look, here's copper way down here. Now, aluminum is a more reactive element than copper is. And so what that means is aluminum is going to bump copper out. So let's write this full equation. I've got aluminum with copper 2 chloride. And now I want to put aluminum together with chloride. It's not AlCl2. In other words, it's not just as simple as swapping the letters around. You have to think about the charges. When aluminum forms an ion, it's in group 13 and therefore would form a plus three charge. Each chloride ion is a minus one. So I need three chlorides for every one aluminum. And so my formula here is AlCl3. Now let me be clear. I'm not talking about balancing equations yet. I'm talking about coming up with the right formula for the product between aluminum and chlorine, and that's AlCl3. Aluminum chloride's formula is AlCl3. 
Some of my students feel a little queasy because of this two and three situation here. We'll fix that by balancing it in a second. But right now, we have to come up with the right formula for the substance, and then we can figure out the quantities later on. What's the other product? Well, it's just that copper that's off on its own. It's been bumped out of this uh, compound with chlorine. So now I'm ready to balance. So I drop a line, I list out the elements, Al, Cu, Cl, Al, Cu, Cl. I've got one, one, and two, one, one, and three. Let's make these sixes. So let's put a three in front here. Six, three. Uh, let's put a two in front there. Two, six. And now let's just uh, fix what we have here. Two in the front of aluminum would make that a two. Three in front of copper would make that a three. So there's my final answer for this one. Okay, a couple layers at play there. You have to look at charges when you're coming up with the right formula. It's something that my students struggle with every year. A lot of times they'll put in AlCl2, not realizing that aluminum needs three chlorides in order for that to be a neutral compound. Okay, something you have to look at and something you, maybe you should have your periodic table nearby as well. Here's another example where it's not just the formulas, now it's the names. Calcium's formula is just Ca. Lead four oxide, well this is Pb4 plus with oxide, which is O2 minus. So let's crisscross these and, and reduce. You get PbO2. Okay, now I have to look at the cations again because calcium is a cation, it's a metal. Uh, when it forms an ion, it's positive, so therefore it would be a cation. And lead is the cation in this. So let's find uh, calcium is here, lead is here. So this is another reaction that'll happen because the lone element is more reactive. So I'm gonna form calcium oxide, which is CaO. This is a plus two, this is a minus two, so I just need one of each. And then lead off on its own. Okay, so let me balance this maybe a little faster without dropping the line. I notice that the only thing that's unbalanced are my oxygens. And so O2 on the left, one on the right, I'm gonna put a two here, that'll solve the oxygens but it also gives me two calciums on the right, so I just put a two in the front there and now I'm all balanced. So, all right, one more, and this is one that's a little different because now we're looking at the anions. Fluorine is F, but don't forget, fluorine is a diatomic element, just like hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen, chlorine, bromine, and iodine are. So F2 is the formula for fluorine. Lithium chloride is LiCl, plus one, minus one. Now, I have to see if this is gonna happen. So in this case, I'm not comparing fluorine against lithium. Because fluorine's a non-metal, and therefore as an ion is negative, I wanna look at the negative ion in this compound. This is chlorine. Is fluorine higher than chlorine? Uh, yep, just by one. So this is gonna happen. Now, lithium fluoride is LiF, the same reason that lithium chloride is LiCl. This is a plus one and this is a minus one. And then chlorine is off on its own, but hey, chlorine is also a diatomic element. So that means this needs to be Cl2 as well for the same exact reason that F2 is F2 and not just F on its own. So the way to balance this, uh, I've got two chlorines on the right and one on the left. So I put a two in the front that gives me two lithiums, though, so I put a two over here. And look, that balances my fluorines as well. Now, if you're thinking, whoa, this is fast to balance these, it's because at this point in the course, you really should be pretty familiar with balancing equations. And if you're not, and you need to drop the line, or if you need to pause this video and do it out for yourself first before you uh, click play again, do that. But one of the things that you have to know is as you do more and more of these, you get faster at them. So... Let's do some practice problems together. Right now, pause the video. Uh, first check to see if these reactions are gonna happen. And if they do, write the balanced uh, full equation. Uh, once that icon in the top right corner goes away, I'll go through the answers. So here we've got Fe and MgO. Uh, Fe is a metal. Mg then is the metal we wanna compare these two. Here's Mg, here's Fe. Fe is lower than Mg. So we're not gonna have a reaction here, no reaction. That one's nice and easy. Sometimes you like those. Uh, how about this one, zinc and hydrochloric acid. Uh, we may have actually done this reaction in class. That's a little hint that it will take place. 
but here zinc is a metal, so it'll form an, a positive ion. So we want to compare it against hydrogen. So uh, we've got zinc here and hydrogen down here. So this is going to take place. Zinc is a plus two ion when it gets into a compound, uh, an ionic compound. Chlorine is a minus one, so I need ZnCl2. And uh, hydrogen off on its own, and that's going to be H2. So here's the uh, full resulting formula, Zn plus two HCl. Got to balance that with a two coefficient in front. Make ZnCl2 and H2. And again, don't forget, that's because zinc has a plus two charge as an ion, and chlorine only has a minus one, so you need two of those. This one is diatomic, so that's why you need two. Uh, hydrogens. Okay. All right. Uh, strontium bromide and cesium <clears throat> would form this as its equation. Uh, SRBr2, that's because strontium is plus two, uh, bromide is minus one, and then you just have a cesium. Um, then you're going to form cesium bromide because cesium is way up here and what are we looking at? Strontium is just underneath it. Uh, and so this is going to happen. Uh, and then when you put cesium, which is in a group one, it's a group one ion, uh, with bromine, it's, uh, you just need one of each there. Strontium's off on its own. At this point, it doesn't have a charge. Uh, but then just to balance it, you need the two in front of cesium and the two in front of cesium bromide, and that should do it. Okay, last one, tin and magnesium hydroxide. Tin is SN. Magnesium hydroxide is Mg. OH2, okay? Um, table five, list of polyatomic ions. If you don't remember, hydroxide is OH with a minus one charge. Because magnesium's in group two, it's gonna get a plus two charge. So that's the right formula for that. But does this reaction happen? Well, if tin is higher than magnesium, it will. The only problem is magnesium's here and tin's down here though. So for this one, no reaction. So that's it. That's single replacement reactions. You have to use the activity series to first see if these reactions are even going to take place. Once they do, you can't just swap the letters in the uh, formulas. You have to look at charges. Make sure you're coming up with the right formula for the resulting ionic compound. And once you do that, then you can balance. I hope this helped. Thank you.